as we get a more accurate picture of the product behavior, the amount of details increases and the implementation, the code, requires the software behaviors full details. With Python, we've seen that the language provides a level of abstraction. We do not write zeros and one, not, not even machine instructions, but we express our algorithm with constructs that are already very close to plain English. This is an abstraction as it hides from us the technical details that we don't need to know about to develop our algorithm. Beyond the implementation language, software can be structured around a common mental model, objects. Object-oriented design is about structuring software with a mental model in which everything can be represented as an object. Objects are representations of things that matter for the software. It can represent a physical object, such as a chair, a building, but also a living entity, such as a human or a pet. It can also be a virtual or intangible element, such as a bank account or a file on a computer. Anything that is relevant to the software being designed. An object has states, which is data that is stored in memory specifically for this object. For instance, a chair could have a color, a size, a real estate, a bank account has a number, a current balance. In the doorbell example, the door is open or closed, locked or unlocked. These are states. In addition, an object has behaviors, abilities to perform actions. For instance, the doorbell can ring while the camera can start capturing a video stream. Object-oriented design is thus a way to organize software into objects that have a coherent set of information and functionalities. We call class the specification of an object. This is the mold that the software uses to create objects with the same specification. For instance, the push button on the front door to ring the bell and the push button in the entrance to open the door, they have the same needs in state and behavior. They can be created out of the same mold, out of the same class. There are four object-oriented principles. The first is the abstraction, the initial motivation for introducing this concept. Abstraction, as we mentioned earlier, is about hiding the complexity and low-level implementation details of internals. In the physical world, when we press the switch button to turn on the light, we expect a behavior, but we do not see the internal mechanism and electrical cables involved. In fact, this is irrelevant to the user. In software, this is an abstraction. We hide the implementation details of the behavior inside the object and only expose the relevant functionality to the user. Remember the concept of the web API while discussing the web and the internet. An API is yet another abstraction. Second, we have the encapsulation, which is about bundling the data, the states, with the methods, the behavior that operate on that data. This prevents accidental or unauthorized access to that data. For instance, the switch of a lamp does not let users disconnect the wire themselves to, to switch from one to another. It encloses the mechanism behind the switch, leaving full control to the switch to do what needs to be done in order to switch on and off the light completely safely. The third principle is modularization, the process of decomposing and making it as modules to reduce the complexity of the overall software. Because we define a coherent set of states and behavior working together, we can more easily split apart the code in different files. We already experienced the notion of modules in the Python programming assignments when we import functions 
from another file. The same applies to classes. Finally, object-oriented design is hierarchical. It is the ordering of abstraction and hierarchy of an interrelated system with other subsystems. Those subsystems might own other subsystems as well. So hierarchy helps reach the smallest possible level of components in a given system. Let's take the example of a lamp again, which can be on or off, that is the state, and the ability to be turned on or off, the behavior. A dimmable lamp would have the same state and behavior, but would also have a brightness state, from 0 to 100%, and the ability to control that brightness, either increasing or decreasing, or even setting a specific value. We could continue with another subsystem, such as a colored lamp, and so on. So we've seen object-oriented design and these four principles. What is the role of designers here? Well, object-oriented will often be the chosen padding to model and implement the software-based product that you design. Beyond understanding the jargon to interact with developers, you might want to be involved in part of the modeling process. It will give you the ability to iterate together with developers on your design as it gets implemented to surface what objects are relevant for the software. We can use the CRC card standing for class, responsibility and collaborators. This modeling technique is suited for a small or medium team of designers and developers working together at surfacing the object-oriented structure of a software. Team members would first identify all the nouns and verbs associated with the problem. The nouns are mentioned on the cards as the name of the class while the verbs become the responsibilities. Superclasses and collaborators are defined as they become obvious. For instance, if one has several cards with similar responsibilities, one defines a superclass with these responsibilities. Collaborators will be classes which are likely to be navigable to from a given class. With the CSE cards, you are connecting your design to the emerging structure of the code. Beyond the CRC cards comes the class diagram from which the structure of the code can be derived. We will dive into the class diagram with a hands-on approach through the Python programming assignment. Object-oriented design is often combined with event-driven design, especially when designing software-based products that interact with the physical world or that are distributed over a network. As we discussed, use case, activity, sequence diagrams, we've touched already on events and triggers, and we also expressed them in the demo video. In software, an event is a runtime operation, something that takes place when the system is running. It is executed by a software element to share information. This information can be as simple as the event itself occurred. It is made available for potential use by software elements not specified by the operation. In our double example, the presence of a visitor can be detected from a motion sensor or directly by the doorbell button being pressed. Through this mechanism, we do not care about where the code is running. We bring the requirement that the doorbell button needs to be able to send a message to the bell. We also revert the responsibilities. We do not want the bell to constantly check whether the button is pressed to adapt its behavior. This would be inefficient and sometimes even unacceptable for the user. Think about a connected lamp checking regularly whether the light switch has been turned on every second. Even checking every second would feel laggy for the user as it would bring a delay of up to one second. 
with events, both the bell and the lamp wait to be notified, an event, and only act upon the reception of this event. Relying on an event-driven mechanism fit the publish-subscribe model. Some parts of the software publish events, others are subscribing to these events to act upon it. It is a typical Internet of Things model with the MQDD protocol. When a software element subscribes to an event, such as the doorbell button is pressed, it provides a handler, that is, a function that describes what to do when receiving the event. This handler function is called each time that the event occurs. What are the key advantages of this mechanism? Well, it is more efficient. We do not continuously ask for information. It is more reactive. We do not wait until the next time we ask. We just receive the information as soon as the event occurs. It separates concerns. We avoid mixing code triggering the event with the code acting on the event. This makes our code much more reusable. And fourth, we make the code more dynamic. Without changing the code, one to many actions can be triggered out of an event. As a designer, you have a view on what information each part of the software needs and when in order to achieve the overall behavior. You might want to specify these events in your flowcharts, for example, often as a start, as it initiates a new flow, or branching into another flowchart. We will practice the event-driven concepts through the Python programming assignment. That's it for this brief introduction to software design. We highlighted the process from storyboard to code. We introduced the use case, activity and sequence diagrams to specify the behavior of the system. We also touched on object-oriented design as a way to structure software and event-driven design as a way to structure the information flow of the software. I invite you to explore further through the book chapter of this week. The knowledge exercise for this week focuses on transitioning from storyboard to a software specification that provides enough ground for conversation in the product team while minimizing ambiguities. Looking forward to your thoughts and reaction on this course. We will discuss them there and we will see you to highlight some themes.